Hi, this is Jeremy Turner, and you are listening to the Sound Architect Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Sound Architect podcast. I am your host Sam Hughes and as you just heard today I am joined by composer Jeremy Turner. Thanks for joining me today Jeremy. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me Sam. It's an absolute pleasure and as I can hear and all our listeners will probably hear as well it's the classic situation of a jackhammer starting the day you want to record a podcast. That's always the way it goes. Yeah, unfortunately <laughs> not not in the studio and uh, traveling at the moment but uh, yeah they decided to break up some concrete right across the street from where we're staying. So my apologies. It's okay. I think it's a great summary for the last year for many of us audio people. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would agree. A lot of problem solving involved. So I'm looking forward to talking to you today about your uh, work on WeWork. But before that, I would love to ask you about how your journey into music composition began. Sure. Um, it was a little bit of a, you know, there was a spark that was lit when I was younger. And then it kind of got derailed by a performance career and then kind of came back later because it was, I don't know, there was something inside of me that was just kind of gnawing away. And um, I, I started playing piano when I was a, a young boy, two, two years old, and um, started kind of plunking out melodies on, on the piano and writing things. And I love how casually you just drop in that you were playing piano at two, <laughs> like, as if that's a normal thing. Well, <laughs> uh, you know, I wasn't playing Mozart or anything like that. But um, <laughs> I mean, it, my my first composition uh, was called There Was a Tow Truck in the Desert. Wow, that sounds really deep. It was uh, it was heavy, man. Um, I, it, <laughs> it was it, there was exactly two notes in the song. Um, and uh, yeah, just there was a tow truck in the desert and I would just play that over and over and over. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, until my parents just said, please stop. But that's um, enough. Please never write music. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, and then I just started, uh, you know, picking out melodies and, and playing things by ear. And, um, sometimes it was film scores. Sometimes it was songs on the radio, whatever it happened to be. And, uh, and then I picked up the cello when I was about, I guess, eight and that kind of took over. Um, and then I went, ended up going to, to Juilliard for, for cello performance. And then I joined the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra when I was about 21. Um, and everything seemed great. I was like, yay, I've made it. Uh, I'm a you know, successful musician and I can pay my rent and all that. And then... Um, Which as a musician is already an accomplishment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, uh, yeah, but then after a couple couple seasons of opera, um, I, you know, there was still something unsettled in, inside of me, and I, I started writing songs and playing guitar, and I started a band, and then I took, you know, tried my hand at composition. I guess in my early thirties, I started writing music for uh, commercials and short films, and just kind of exploring, um, and it got to a point where, you know, I, I decided to give it a go, and and you know, let the reins of the orchestra go and, and, uh, try my hand out at, at composing full time. And I was, I think 36 at the time when I, when I finally, you know, said, okay, I'm, I'm doing this. So that's quite a big jump as well, especially at 36, when you've been in the kind of musician career mindset for so long, how did you kind of get your head around and how did you prepare for the fact that you're like, okay, I'm going to go write music. This is it. You know, I think, coming to the decision wasn't easy because I, I was giving up a lot, but it was, it was also very gradual and, and kind of years in the making, you know, when I was 29, I had taken a year off from the orchestra and, and I, I went and played in an orchestra in New Zealand and, you know, taught at the uni there. And that gate, that was kind of the big pause that gave me time to kind of evaluate where my career was going and what was important to me. And, and I came back to New York and played a few more seasons. Um, but by the time I'd come back, I, I really was, you know, kind of starting to dabble in, in other things. And, um, and but yeah, once the decision was made, I, I think getting to that point was hard. But once the decision was made, it was it was quite easy because it was I realized that um, I, I wasn't as lucky as I was. And, as, and you know, I, I felt very grateful to have that position in the orchestra. I, it wasn't... Uh, 
well, to, to quote Jerry Maguire, it, it was not, I wasn't complete, <laughs> you know, I, yeah, I, I, no, I needed, that makes sense. I, I, there was something itching and, and I, and I needed to scratch it. And that was, that was writing and, and sort of creating my own, uh, path and sort of bushwhacking my way from there. So, so yeah, it was a bit unconventional in that, um, I didn't go to school for it. I didn't come up as an assistant to, uh, you know, a well-known film composer or anything like that. I, I really had to kind of just blaze my own trail and and uh and was a little late to the game but at the same time i also felt that i was coming to it from a pretty unique place in terms of my understanding of of music as a whole and and orchestration and all all, all that goes with that so um yeah it wasn't like i was like in a band and then you know we stopped touring and i had to figure out how to do something so i, I guess I'll, you know I, it was i did it because i really wanted to do it yeah you just had that drive there yeah and so were you writing on the side for fun or anything when you were performing, like throughout your performing years, were you always kind of dabbling? I was, yeah. It was, you know, it's, it's, man, it was funny. The, this band that I played in, it, was, it only lasted like a year or two, but uh, the drummer from, from our band was the uh, percussionist in the orchestra. So there was a couple times where we would literally play, you know, a Verdi opera or something, finish at 11 o'clock, and then, uh, you know, hop in a cab, take our tuxedos off, go downtown and play a midnight <laughs> show down in the village somewhere. In, in oh, New man, York. that sounds and awesome. So it was a, there's kind of a Batman, Bruce Wayne kind of, you know, dub, <laughs> double life there for a while. So are you um, now fully Batman or fully Bruce I, I, Wayne? I'm not sure which one's which, but <laughs> <laughs> but I definitely took, you know, a cape off at some point. So, um, but yeah, it... it uh, it, it, it was challenging there for a while. I mean, it, I really did feel like I was living a double life because I'd, I'd, I'd have rehearsal um, in the orchestra in the morning and then afternoon I'd go down to this studio that I'd kind of put together with a friend down in Chelsea and um, would would write music and try and hustle and find projects and, and then, uh, you know, order a quick dinner and then back up town put on the tuxedo and go play play an opera so it was it was Man. really long days there for a while yeah which um you know forgive me for saying this but in our younger days it's easier right to burn the candles at both ends for a while Absolutely. and then you get to this point where you're like okay i have to pick something <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah that it, it was not sustainable not only for for my health and my relationships and all that kind of thing but just yeah I, you, you you can't keep doing that um for too long you've got to find find a way to yeah as you said pick something and, and put all your eggs in one basket and just go for it so it sounds like such a cliche and i sound so, so old for even saying this and we're not <laughs> even that old um but it really is like when you're just like oh i'm invincible i can do everything let's do this and i'll do this and i'll dabble in that and i can handle yeah. everything right um and then you realize that like well i could if i wanted to start suffering <laughs> right right it's you start adding up like did I make it to the gym this week? No. You know, how many espressos have I had today? You know? Yeah. Did I eat takeout all week? <laughs> yeah, exa exactly. <laughs> yeah. Once you start operating on, on, you know, you've got artificial uh, things holding you up, you know, it's like, okay, it's time to get in check here. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So was there kind of like a light bulb moment for you when you got to that kind of precipice where you're like, I need to write music. That's the one. That's what I need to do. Um, I don't know if there was a there was a singular moment for me. Um, I always had, you know, belief that that I could compose music and 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 write music at the highest level. But I think, oddly enough, it was maybe a monetary thing that that gave me the confidence that I could actually do this because I didn't want to leave, you know, an orchestra job with and and all the security that comes with that to you know just struggle and and be miserable. And um, so. Oddly enough, I started writing music for uh, commercials at first, um, which proved to be a great way to kind of, you know, expand my toolkit because, uh, you know, one day you're writing hip hop stuff and the next day you're writing country music and the next day it's an orchestral thing or you really have to, you know, expand your chops with, with that kind of work. And But I, I was lucky enough to write the music for... I, I think it was the first commercial that that Google ever did. It was it aired on the Super Bowl. Oh, nice! And it was a you know it was this simple piano piece, you know. But once I saw how lucrative that kind of work was, I was like, okay, well, this is this could give me the 
the safety net I need to, you know, leave the orchestra. And if all else fails, like, I think I'll be okay writing music for commercials. And so that kind of gave me the confidence to, to, to jump off the cliff and, and then uh, gradually built up from there, you know, commercials lead to short films and short films lead to longer films. And then, you know, concert music and art installations and, you know, anything I could get my hands on, I was just going for it. Amazing. I'm just curious if I can ask, Mm. you say about the financial security of the orchestra, I have no idea how that even works. Like, do you get a salary like for being in the orchestra? Yeah. So, I mean, every orchestra is different. So, you know, the, the, and it's different depending on which country you're in. Um, you know, in Europe, a lot of the orchestras are sponsored and in, in part, uh, sometimes in full by, by the government. Um, in the States, it really just depends on um, where you end up. And it's not always like with the sports teams. It's not always the biggest cities that have the best orchestras and the highest paid orchestras. But um, at the time when I joined, um, yeah, the Metropolitan Opera was the was the highest paid orchestra in the country. So nice. I was... 21 and and had a you know a really nice salary 52 week paycheck and um you know benefits and the whole thing so it was kind of it really was a watershed moment for me you know i mean i i almost couldn't believe it i was like i loved playing cello it made me very happy and i i couldn't believe that all of a sudden i could go from you know eating canned soup to you know going out to a nice restaurant in new york and actually <laughs> you know treating my friends once in a while or whatever it happened to be um, but yeah, if, if you're in a, if you're in a top orchestra, it's, uh, it's a pretty lucrative place to be. Yeah, I can imagine. It must've been quite difficult mentally as well, making the jump when, you know, I can only imagine being that young and in one of the highest paid orchestras, you know, how do you get over that moment of like, man, I should appreciate this, but I kind of want to do something else. I struggled with that. And, 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 you know, I, I wondered how, you know, if I played, uh, the butterfly effect game or whatever, I wondered how different it might have been had I, you know, worked my way up through, you know, smaller orchestras and then, you know, gradually reached this, what I consider to be pinnacle later in my life, how, how I might have appreciated it more, or I might have not been able to roll the dice and, and try other things. But yeah, I was lucky in that that was just where I ended up. And, um, but I, I remember vividly joining the orchestra and there was, I think at the time, five of us under the age of 30 in the orchestra oh wow and at the end of my first season we went out on a on a, on a tour of the states and you know everybody's just having very different conversations people you know oh my kids are in <laughs> school and i'm repaving my driveway this weekend and blah 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 you know and like the five of us were just like you know let's go play video games and go to the pub <laughs> and like you know it, we, let's it go just get a, drunk <laughs> yeah it was just like a very different uh different mindset at the time <laughs> but uh but yeah you, you find your way amazing okay so let's talk about we work which is already sure. a tongue twister for me never mind the actual full title <laughs> which is we work or the making and breaking of a 47 billion dollar unicorn it is a long there we go as a long it. title you got it <laughs> well done sam <laughs> so how did you first get involved in the project you know it's funny i i was very lucky to have had quite a bit of work in in 2020 and a lot of it was kind of already backlogged um so i knew it was going to be busy even before the pandemic hit but i reached that point where i, I mean god i think it was maybe in late july where i could finally take a breath and i and i felt you know very fortunate to have work yeah. um because so many pro so many projects uh, i'm sure the same for you just stopped and started and, or got put on hold or w whatever it happened to be. And so I had reached a point where I was like, okay, I think I've finally hit the big pause. I don't think there's going to be anything incoming for a little while now, whether it's, you know, reshoots or actors schedules or whatever it happens to be. Yeah. Um, and then I got this call uh, from my agent and I, I think they had already started making this film, but one of the luxuries that documentaries have is, I think they're depending on the subject matter. Obviously, is it's just a little easier to sh you know shoot a documentary during a pandemic than it is a big <laughs> yeah, you know imagine with a big crew and all that stuff. So, um, so yeah, uh, Jed Rothstein, the the director, had managed to complete this or or, or get it almost done, and and uh, so we had a phone call, and I I thought it was going to be sort of a, a traditional introductory 
you know, explanatory phone call that lasts 20, 30 minutes. And we, we had to keep finding more time to continue our conversation. We talked for hours. Oh, wow. Um, and I, and I really, uh, I, I knew very little of, of the collapse of WeWork or the rise of WeWork. Yeah. I have to admit, I, I know nothing about it. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I knew from the headlines, like, I mean, my, my, you know, five second takeaway was that it, there was a CEO that liked the party a lot yeah. and didn't know, didn't know how to maybe run a company and it just had a fiery death. And, and, but I didn't know how spectacular that was, but the, but the interesting thing about it was, especially through the lens of a pandemic was that, you know, I, I never understood as a composer and, you know, I've, I've worked in studios and worked with other people before. But um, I never realized the, the power that so many people, you know, th 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 that drive of people wanting to be connected and wanting to, um, you know, be a part of something. And, I, and for, for whatever reason, that thing just spiraled out of control. But it, I think, yeah, as you said in the title, it was worth $47 billion at one point. And then it, it was almost insolvent in a matter of weeks. So that's insane. It was a, it, it was a pretty fantastic crash. Um, but I think a lot of it was you know hype and um people people believing in something but after the dust settled sure there was a lot of you know uh books that didn't line up and a lot of metrics and just basic cold hard math that didn't didn't have uh you know solid answers but what was left after the dust settled was th that feeling of connectivity that 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 people really need uh yeah you know and and as as we see in this past year it's it's you need it more than ever you know so um so i thought that was an interesting thing to play with this this kind of uh together versus alone and and then there was a lot of um mystique around this company and and you know some people thought it was hot air some people thought it was incredibly inspirational and life-changing and and so playing with you know all those hopes and dreams and and then there was a technology aspect of it which which we delved into with the score a little bit um in that one of its biggest investors maybe maybe the biggest investor was masa this japanese investor who believes in the singularity which is you know that, that ai is going to take over the world and so he just invests billions and billions and billions of dollars i mean it makes hedge funds look like you know, cute little credit unions in a small town, you know I mean? He, yeah. he puts all of his money into this. And, um, so, so we ended up with this kind of strange hybrid score of some, you know, relatable organic human instruments. Um, and then we got to play with a bunch of fun synthesizers and, and, you know, find a way to make those two meet and, and, and melt together. That's awesome. So what kind of, uh, did you have to do an initial pitch? Were you given a brief for the like instigation of writing the music? Not really. I, you know, we talked, I asked him a little bit about it, what he had been playing with, what his editor had been playing with in terms of temp music. And um, there was all kinds of things that they'd been exploring. And it was a real, you know, kind of, <laughs> it was a, it was a big bucket of tunes from, from opera to, you know, Biggie Smalls to, I mean, like literally every, 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 everything was in there. Good mix. Yeah. So it was, it was trying to find a way to create a sound for the film that, you know, helped tell the story ultimately, but that didn't end up sounding like a grab bag where you just couldn't get any, you know, footing, you know, and, yeah. and we've all heard films like that sometimes where you're just like, you know, the cues jump all over the map in terms having of having an identity and crisis. Just, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So try, trying to um, find, a, find a unifying voice that, that would help thread the, the gap. Yeah, and you're by no means a stranger to documentaries. Like you've scored quite a few by now, right? I have, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure how that happened exactly, but um, it's kind of the first big one was, um, well, the first film I ever scored was, was a documentary um, called Narco Cultura. Um, but the first kind of, feather in my cap, so to speak, was, was this documentary series called five came back, um, which was on Netflix. And, and yeah, I think for whatever reason that seemed to, uh, open up a lot of documentary doors, so to speak. And what did you learn working on these documentaries over the years that you maybe brought to this project? The interesting thing for me about working on docs as opposed to narrative films, and, and I've done both is it's the approach is not really that different. 
you know, ultimately you're trying to find the characters and could be thematic material or light motifs for, for certain characters or certain uh, scenes. And it, you're still helping tell the story. So, and, and I think one of the exciting things about uh, documentary series and films these days, aside from the fact that there's so many, you know, now that you yeah. have all these streaming platforms, they, they seem to, I mean, it's almost silly to say they're having like a, a golden era because they, they have been now for a while. Yeah, there's been a lot more documentaries over the last few years, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think the the approach for me is always the same. So, you know, the, the fun thing for me is if you, I think if you listen to some of the scores that I've written out of context and you just listen to them as pieces of music, I mean, some of them you could, I, I did one for this Aaron Hernandez project and God, the majority of the music you could put in like Blade Runner or something like that and it would be perfectly <laughs> fine, you know? Um, yeah. So I think whereas in the olden days, you know, partially for budgetary reasons or, or whatnot, but you'd end up with a lot of <laughs> sort of just droney scores, you know, for documentaries where you just hear like, you know, one note playing for a couple minutes and just this underbelly and it's not very interesting. And, you know, and then you hear a couple high piano notes and then you're done, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it's it's been fun to to use my background and, and especially with orchestra stuff. Uh, I did a, a documentary a couple of years ago called Strokes of Genius, which was all about uh, Federer and Nadal and, uh, and Wimbledon final from 2008. And it was, it was, it's like a tennis opera. I mean, it's all like big orchestra, solo violinist, like very untraditional, you know, instrumentation, I thought for what people might come to expect from a documentary so it's it's been a fun area to play in and trying to sort of change that narrative and move the needle a little bit but but yeah uh, ultimately it's just you're writing for the story and yeah so how does it work do you watch the whole documentary before you start scoring or do you kind of just watch certain scenes or i i'd say the big the big difference between documentaries and narratives is that, you know, narratives are, are, are more or less set. So, I mean, sure, they can always do reshoots or, you know, change the timings somewhat with scenes, but documentaries are constantly evolving up until the last minute in terms yeah. of how, how the edit goes. Um, so that can be challenging. You know, you, you end up chasing the edit a little bit and, you know, you finish something, you're like, oh, this is great. And then they change it. And you're like, ah, oh, we got to figure out how to, you know, shoehorn this back in. So, you know, I, I think the, the most important thing is just remaining flexible and, and patient, you know, which is easier some days than, than others. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and how did you get to that first moment? Like, what did you do first? For, uh, for the WeWork film? Yeah. We talk about, you know, when you kind of have a kickoff call, especially on a documentary, one of my first big questions is, okay, what's going to change the least? You know, so yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll ask an editor you know, what are, do you have any tentpole scenes or moments or things that you think you're, you, you feel pretty solid that this is going to kind of stay as is or pretty close to it. And so, yeah, you try and pick, uh, I, oddly enough for, for the WeWork film, I think I scored the, the final four minutes of the film, um, first. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, which, which is a little bit backwards, but, um, but it also was helpful because it, help me know where I needed to get to, you know, it's, it's sort of like reading the last pages of a book. Yeah. It's almost like working your way backwards. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and you see, you know, you'll see films like Michael Clayton comes to mind and other films where you'll see, you know, something happen near the beginning of the film. And then you, and then you realize how they get there at the end and you, you've either forgotten about it. Yeah. Um, or, or you're kind of remembering it and trying to figure out how you get back to that. So so sort of the musical equivalent of that. And this is one of the things I love about music and the kind of any creative field, really. Mm -hmm. Apart from certain, obviously, no-goes, there's no definite right way to go around it. There's right. no, you don't have to start from the beginning and work your way to the end. You've just sort of just got to see what serves the project and then kind of go with the flow, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, and and when, I, when things get busy and I'm stacked up, you know, working on multiple things at once, I almost feel like a you know, like a short order cook, you know, I'm just like, okay, what am I, what do I need to do today? And, and I, and I have to get sort of more microscopic and, and not think about, oh God, this is so daunting. I have, you know, 
45 minutes left of music to write on this project and 20 minutes left on it. It's just like, okay, what do I need to do today? What scene is important? You know, what, what am I going for? And, and part of my team that, you know, we've built out over the last couple of years has, has become super important to me and, and in terms of, uh, just ease of workflow and, uh, confidence and all that. And, and so I have a, a really good friend and colleague that I work with named Abe Manasmar and, um, he's sort of my music editor and score mixer and, and he makes these, you know, beautiful spreadsheets, uh, that, <laughs> that, that just kind of Google docs, you know, that, and it, yeah, I'll, I'll text him in the morning. I'm like, okay, what am I doing today? And he's like, okay, you know, you need to score this scene and make sure you, you know, dovetail out by the time, you know, character X says this and you want to reach a high point at this, you know, frame rate. Oh or, man, that or, sounds amazing. Yeah. It's, it, it, he, it, I, I make it sound easier than it is, but it, he almost makes it like paint by numbers for me. Yeah. You know, it's just like, here's what you have to do. And, and, and it helps block out the, the weight of, you know, just this daunting, you know, feeling that you have like, Oh God, I, I have so much more music to write, you know, and I have to get it done in the next couple of weeks or whatever it happens to be. So. Yeah. Well, the deadlines can also be quite tight and you must have had multiple projects on the go at once. I have. Yeah. 2020 was particularly challenging because yeah, I had, I had a, um, a six part series on, on Netflix called immigration nation. And I had, um, two episodes of chef's table and then, uh, <laughs> and then a documentary about how search works for Google. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I think over the last year I've written about over 12 hours of, of score. So it was, oh wow yeah, That's it was, a a, it was, a, it was a lot. And, and, and it's, it's challenging. And it, it, it's funny. I talk to other composer friends or, or writers or, and there's no, it seems I'm, I'm either in fifth gear or I'm in park and I, and there's yeah. just no, there's no middle. There's no in middle. between. Yeah. It's just all, all cylinders firing or nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's the same for anybody, whether you're in construction or law or medical, uh, medical, uh, obviously would be in fifth gear this past year, but, but everyone's striving for that work-life balance and, and, you know, it's, it's rarely achieved, but highly sought after. <laughs> yeah. And how do you, I mean, do you just go by the nearest, quickest fire that needs to be put out? How do you decide which one to write first? Cause it's inspiring, right? Inspiration. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, you know, in, in an ideal world, you're not working on multiple things at the same time. Of course. Um, so, but it, when it happens or you have overlap or a production date shifts and all of a sudden you find your, you know, you can be in a situation where it's like, hurry up and wait. Like I'm all ready to go. Like, why aren't they ready? And, you know, and you just have to wait. And then of course the, they all come crashing down at the same time. Um, yeah. It's nearest fire first. It's, it's almost like, you know, running a, an emergency room or something. It's like, okay, this, this, this director has been waiting for a couple of days. Like we need to make sure he or she gets to hear this now. And um, this can wait. And you just, yeah, but it is hard. You, you you do become almost schizophrenic at times yeah. because you know you might be working on something with a, a lush orchestral suite, you know, flutes and harps and pianos uh, before lunch, and then the afternoon you're in like dark synthesizer action <laughs> adventure. You know, it, it's just you have to be able to change gears really quickly. Yeah, and I was going to ask because not only do you have to change quite quickly. What if you're inspired for the other project while you're trying to work on this one? And you're like, oh, but I've got so many ideas, but I need to try and ignore them because I need to get this done first. You know, I, I know a lot of songwriters do this. I, I've only done this a handful of times, but the if a melody comes to me or, or something, maybe I could be on a walk or just going to clear my head or something. You just take a little memo on the iPhone you know, yeah. and, 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 and then come back to it later. Um, or you know, you just build a little folder, a side folder of, you know, of, uh, if an idea comes to you, but, but typically I'm pretty good at staying in the lane of what I'm doing. I don't, I don't, uh, cross pollinate too often. Um, but it, but it is fun. You know, it, it, when you listen to some of the great composers from the past, every now and then, you know, whether it's Strauss or Mahler, or you'll hear themes from other symphonies that kind of sneak into something else that they wrote 10 years later. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, that, that does happen, you know, um, for sure. You, you, you might end up like, wow, this, this 
theme I just wrote feels so familiar to me. I really <laughs> like it. And you're like, this is working really well. You're like, oh, drat. I wrote this five years ago for something else. You know, it's, yeah. it's, so it, that, that does happen. But, um, but yeah, in terms of ideas coming to me, I, I, I tend to stay in the, in the vacuum of, of the project that's directly in front of me. And what about when you have to switch mindsets? Do you ever listen to other music to get your head in the game? Like like you say, say you were going from an orchestral thing in the morning to dark synthesizers in the afternoon. Would you do something to switch that mindset or would you just sit down and just get into it? Um, mostly just sit down and, and get into it. I mean, I, I heard something the other day that I, I really liked. There, there's, there's no output without input. Right. So... You know, obviously, as as artists and whether you're a painter or a singer or whatever, you know, you're always borrowing from things that you've heard or 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 seen or um, so there, there's a sh certain element of that. But, yeah, unlike, you know, unlike an actor who might like, you know, go punch the wall 10 times before they have like a big, <laughs> you know, intense scene. I'm not I'm not coming up with playlists, you know, to kind of help inspire me. Um I think it could be a blessing or it could be a curse. The the hard drive in my mind, I've played so much music in my life. You know, when you add up all the operas and symphonies and, um, you know, I love jazz. I love, I try to stay pretty up to date on, on popular music and, and then, you know, going all the way back to Zeppelin and Beatles and Louis Armstrong and all that stuff is, in my head all the time, you know, I mean, yeah. there's, there's constant, constantly. So it's, it's, it's kind of, it's not too far away if I need to, to draw on something for inspiration. Awesome. So going back to WeWork then, yeah. what would you say was your kind of proudest moment on the project? Interesting. Um, I, there's a, there's a couple cues that I'm, that I'm really proud of. Oddly enough, that, that, that final four minutes of the, of the film that I, the first thing I wrote was my favorite. Nice. Which, coincidentally didn't end up in the film oh no <laughs> so, yeah um they had a they had a temp thing that they just they really loved and they just couldn't couldn't shake it which happens sometimes yeah um so yeah in a funny way i think m my favorite thing that i wrote won't won't end up in the film but um <laughs> sometimes the way yeah exactly um so yeah tr truthfully that that would probably <laughs> probably be the answer <laughs> so and what about the flip side then? What would you say was the most challenging moment? I think the challenging the challenging thing for me was as people in all fields have discovered in this last 20 years, last year rather, uh, of 2020 and, and into 2021 is just the, the production aspect. You know, just finding whether you have the budget or not, just finding a way to produce something that needs to be at the highest level um, but, you know, oh, can we go record an orchestra? No, we can't do that right now. Oh, yeah. okay. Um, man, I'd love to have, you know, it, again, coming up as a musician, when it comes time to record, some of the best musicians in the world are in my Rolodex. So, like, I know exactly who I want when I'm writing something, yeah. whether it's a clarinet part or a violin solo or whatever. And so, yeah, not not being able to have that at your disposal during this time is is challenging. And I know some musicians have have gotten, you know, have had to rise to the challenge and, and set up their own little home recording rig, you know, people that would have never done it before and and they've had to figure out a way to get it going. And um, yeah, a lot of people have had to figure out the whole record from home setup these days. Right, yeah. right. It could, I mean, many of whom's, you know, livelihood depends on it. Yeah. And many of whom have never had to deal with it before. Exactly, exactly. So like, I, I mean, I get emails all the time from friends like you know what kind of interface should i buy you know what is an interface you know like <laughs> yeah. it's just all that kind of stuff so but uh yeah i'd say that was probably the biggest challenge it's just trying to to find a way to to give everything life um and make it sound as real as possible when you know it's it's hard to get everybody in a room at the same time I, my abe my my score mixer did a masterful job as he always does with with all my projects but there was one in particular um earlier in the year it was a chef's table episode that it was a small ensemble so it was string quartet guitar drums and clarinet and that was it for the whole oh and piano and that was it for the whole uh for the whole score and i played the cello parts and the piano parts 
you know, the clarinetist was in LA, the guitarist was in Nashville and the violinist and violist was in, uh, New York. Oh, wow. And to achieve this kind of small ensemble sound as if we're all playing in the same room, even though it was all done, you know, somebody's recording in their bathroom, and I'm, <laughs> I'm, you know, it's just, it's, it's definitely, uh, created some challenges. So, you know, as was that, as with everything, it, it, it just takes a little longer and it takes a little problem solving and, and, uh, you know, but you do what you got to do. So, yeah, man. I mean, I, I take my hat off to anyone who's able to produce anything during the last year or so. It's, it's an amazing like feet just to even finish something i think yeah yeah it's funny i i was re <laughs> i was reading this article the other day uh, tracy letts the uh playwright and actor and he w he wrote this great piece about just he was just really honest he's like asked his wife for six hours of quiet every day so that he could go write and he he'd write for weeks and just just come up with nothing he's yeah like, this is just awful and and um, and then on the flip side, you've got like Taylor Swift, who's like put out two albums, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. and hasn't even met some of the people that she collaborated with, you know, um, in person. So, but I think it's hard, you know, especially when you're writing, you know, you, you you're drawing on your experiences and, yeah. um, and, and when all of our experiences lately have been in this void and well, mostly online, really. Yeah. Mostly online. It's, it's not the most inspiring thing for sure. So it's, it's you really got to dig deep to, you know, find something. Yeah, I can imagine. And how, how do you keep yourself motivated during these times without as much inspiration as you could have before? Um, I've been lucky in that where, where we live in California, we have a lot of space. So, um, you know, I'll just take the dog for, a, you know, a walk in the mountains and, and I'm, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have that. Um, and then since coming up to Vancouver, things are relatively normal up here. Um, so that, you know, you can, you can sit outside and, you know, have a beer and talk to somebody and, and, and I've been lucky to, to, to make it work. I, I, the people I feel s sorriest for are, you know, uh, believe me, there are many days when I'm in this apartment with my wife and daughter and dog, and I'm just like, everybody get out, <laughs> you know, I need, <laughs> I need quiet. Um, but then you've got, you know, people that are single and weren't anticipating this and they're just all alone and they've got to find ways to keep them, you know, driving. And, and, uh, so I, I, I don't really have a good answer for that, but uh, you, you just, you take inspiration from wherever you can. I mean, for me, it's been, yeah, taking walks and, and nature, but also, you know, using this time to, there, there was a comedian that said, I forget who it was. So what are you doing this weekend? He's like, well, I don't know. I already watched all of Netflix, and <laughs> you, you know, but there is a lot of time for it seems the, for people to watch films and and documentaries and shows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, like the Matrix. And so you know, you can take inspiration from that. You know, um, so yeah, I don't know. You just take it wherever you can find it. Really, these days. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so sadly, I'm drawing to my my final questions. Um, right. First one being. If you can tell us, what other projects do you have coming out soon that you can talk to us about? I have, um, well, the, so the WeWork film comes out on April 2nd on, on Hulu. And um, I have two other projects that unfortunately I'm not able to talk about. Of at the course, moment. classic. Um, <laughs> and uh, other than that, like the things that I can talk about, I have um, a concert piece uh, commissioned for... Uh, chamber music piece uh, in South Carolina next summer. It was supposed to be this summer, but like everything's been postponed. Yeah. Yeah. And then just take, taking some time to, you know, I, I don't know what other composers and songwriters are doing, but, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a um, any downtime at all, just taking that time to, you know, take stock over your rig or your systems or, you know, your publishing or just making sure because we rarely get time to do those things so, yeah exactly um, yeah so i mean there's a little bit of that but uh so much more admin happening right now <laughs> there's a there's a lot of admin there's definitely a lot of admin um but uh yeah i i wish i could tell you about the the other projects but i'm not at liberty to do so yet yeah i think we're very used to uh used to that line <laughs> yeah <laughs> so my final final question that I have for you uh -huh. um, can be a bit of a doozy for people. Okay. Meaning of life? Oh, almost. <laughs> <laughs> if you could go back in time 
and talk to your younger younger self, what piece of advice would you give yourself? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, start composing earlier. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I look. I I'm very happy with where I'm at, and and all those cliche sayings. You know, it's it's not about the destination; it's about the journey and all that sort <laughs> yeah. of stuff. But but yeah, I would I would have I would have started playing guitar a little earlier, started writing some songs earlier. I think it's the curse of knowledge, right? Once you know, you're like, man, I wish I was doing this so much sooner. Yeah, I just, I, I love writing music and I and I, I just wish I had been working on Sundance projects in my early 20s as opposed to my, you know, mid 30s and, and, and really getting out there, um, especially as a composer because you, you know, whether we like it or not, composers typically are riding the coattails of, the directors they work with, you know, so it's, it's all about, you know, who, you know, and, and, and building that trust in those relationships. And, and so, yeah. And it's a highly competitive field, highly competitive. And it, it, it's funny. I, I had a conversation with uh, James Newton Howard the other day, and he was just telling me what it was like when he started and, you know, people didn't, they weren't able to make demos sound good back then. I mean, yeah. they literally had to write everything and, and produce it and, you know put put together a huge uh production and be like do you like it no i don't like it start over oh okay God. you know so <laughs> like weeks um, of work yeah and and analog tape and, and yeah. not having midi uh evolved to to the point where it's at or samples or anything like that so but he also said there was just a handful of them you know it wasn't today you've got thousands of composers you know um man i can only imagine how many there are these days yeah it's 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 uh it's a it's a vast field and there's a lot of talented people out there um so yeah i i think it, that would be the one thing i would just start earlier but but short of that which is you know obviously i can't can't do that <laughs> what's done is done um i've i think i've kind of stayed true to what i wanted to do you know i'm um i think saying yes and 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 being willing to take risks and and take chances and i mean i'm getting back to the orchestra thing like i remember when i left like the the final two people that were telling me not to were were my dad and my accountant <laughs> you know there's like what are you doing you've got this tenured position like why would you leave this you know but it turned out to be a good thing so you know just trusting yourself and you know going with your gut instinct yeah and i think that's what's most important you know it doesn't really matter when you get to the party but you know you've You've decided what's true to you and what matters to you. Right. And 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 at that point, you're going to be able to, you know, be yourself and, and write music that comes from you as opposed to, you know, something artificial or something that sounds like something else or, you know, it's this is who I am and this is this is the, the music I write. Yeah, exactly. And it's one of those things where, like, if you did start earlier, maybe you wouldn't have had enough performing experience that informed the, the way you write. Exactly. Awesome. Well, I have to say it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show today, Jeremy. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. It's been been great talking with you, Sam. It really has. And I hope you had as much fun as I did. And we'll see you again in the near future. That sounds great. Excellent. Thanks again, Jeremy. And thanks everyone for listening. Cheers. Bye-bye. this is sam thanks very much for listening to the sound architect podcast today i hope you enjoyed this episode if so there are many ways you can support the show which is incredibly appreciated obviously there's the financial way where you can support us on patreon which is patreon.com forward slash sound design uk however there are many other ways which also help such as liking subscribing reviewing commenting and sharing via whatever channel you listen on Thanks so much for your support already. It really is a work of passion for me, and I'd love to keep sharing the knowledge from all these talented and wonderful people. Thanks again, and catch you on the next episode.